What's good, y'all? This your girl, Kiyomi Leslie, and I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastard. Work it, yeah, work it, uh, yeah, work it, and work it good. All right, y'all, so we have the beautiful, emphasis on beautiful, <laughs> Kiyomi here off the porch today. How are you feeling? Yeah, it's amazing. I feel amazing. It's nice outside. I'm looking good. You looking good. Period. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I want to congratulate you on your bundle of joy. Welcome to the Mommy Club, girl. Thank you. Oh, you got a baby. Yes, I do. Okay. I got a five yes. Around. Seven months, girl. Seven months. So, how has motherhood been treating you so far? Motherhood is crazy. Like, it's, um, it's definitely ex an experience that I feel like every woman should experience, but... It's very humbling, like I was one of those people who my life was very fast and I was like getting flewed out, I'm on a plane here, there, and now I'm like, no, I don't have a sitter today, I'm not, I'm not able to come, so it's, it's very different. Were you one of those parents, well not parents, but were you one of those people that be like, my child would never do this, my child would never do that, and now that you have your own kid, you kind of just like, ooh. Um, no, I was the cool TT. I was the T -T, cool TT. Okay. Everybody wanted to come to TT house. But um, I do feel like now that I have my own child, I'm able to like see what other people are talking about because you can give a lot of advice when you don't have kids. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually have a kid, it's, it's like, wow, I didn't even think about that. Like I have a sister, well, two sisters and they both have children. And I'm like, it's not that hard. And I'm like calling them like, it's hard, it's really hard. <laughs> Now, I did see on your IG that you posted, like, you had clumps of hair yes. coming out. Yes. And I know that was from your wash days yeah. and also from, like, the postpartum whenever you lose hair. People do not know that you can lose hella hair after you Girl, have a baby. Like, I literally called my grandmother and I was, like, sending her pictures and I'm like, yo, my hair is falling out. And at first I didn't notice it, but my sister kind of was like, it looks like your hairline is like, it's like thinning. And I'm like, no, it's not. And so I, I was kind of in denial at first when I started losing hair. And I started losing my hair around three to four months postpartum. And it started around like the, from, from side to side, from like the front, the um, perimeter. And I was just like doing research and I just really was like, something is wrong. It's not, this is not right. And, um, and I found out that it was postpartum and that a lot of women actually go through it. And I saw a lot of girls on Instagram really speaking about it. And it made me feel really good because I'm like, okay, I was embarrassed. I was really embarrassed because, I mean, a, a woman's hair is like everything to her sometimes. So, you know, I was just like, damn, okay, so I'm not alone. Other girls are going through it. And I just started taking my prenatals. I'm not really good with taking pills, hence how my baby got here in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... It's, it's all better now. My hair is getting healthier. I'm using my rice water and deep conditioning. So it's getting better. I know that's right. Yes. So as I was researching you that I saw that you were originally from North Carolina. Raleigh. So what was it like for you growing up there? Um, um, hmm. I was totally different than I am now. I can say that. Um, if you would have told me I was going to be who I am today, I would be like, you're lying. <laughs> That's not going to be me because I was into books and everything. I was not into guys. I dated women for five years. So I, I lived a totally different lifestyle. Um, it was it was very chill. Raleigh is not really up to date on a lot of things that are going on in Atlanta. So. I feel like I was somebody's auntie considering how I was dressing. Like the dress game was weak, the hair <laughs> game weak, makeup. I was just using bronzer, looking orange as hell. Um, but all in all, I feel like Raleigh is a place where you go to settle down. And I just felt like I was a shark swimming with goldfish and I wanted something that was more challenging to me. And so I moved to Atlanta. Ooh, now, what age would you say you started experiencing life on your own? <sighs> experiencing life on my own, shit. Well, you know, I jumped off the porch <laughs> at, um, like, let's say I jumped off the porch at like 17, 18. I got my own um, townhouse at 18. Um, I was really in and out the house because when I started dating girls, it was kind of like one of those things where my mom was like, I'm not having that. You, you date girls? So I'm like, all right, whatever. So I just kind of was living from girlfriend to girlfriend at that point. And then I got my own place because I was like, I'm tired of these 
females. <laughs> and so um, after that, I mean, it was up ever since. Like I never not had my own spot. And then once um, I turned 21, I was like, I'm moving to Atlanta and I ain't never looked back. What was the biggest life lesson that you learned while you were on your own at an uh, early age? Um, life taught me to not depend on anybody else but myself. Um, and I don't know if that's like really a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it was a lesson that I had to learn because it was just like, once you start paying bills, you can't depend on other people to pay your bills. Like, I didn't have the silver spoon. Like, people may think I've had, you know, um, I had to work for everything that I got and I started dancing and that really taught a lot of people look down on dancing, but I feel like dancing taught me all the life lessons that I was, I was supposed to learn and reasons why I'm where I'm at because it taught me how to be a woman. It taught me how to have good, perfect hygiene because these guys coming in here spending money, they don't want you looking or anything other than, you know, so, and it taught me how to be a hustler. So, um, yeah. And as we get on the topic of exotic dancing, mm -hmm. I did see that you ended up suing the gentleman's club that you were oh, at. Oh, man. What happened with that? Uh, well, I ain't really supposed to be talking about that right now because they made me sign something. But, you know, all I'm going to say is um, when you um, are a dancer, you're supposed to be an independent contractor. And when clubs treat you like you are not, an independent contractor when they make you pay house fees ladies when they make you um pay the tip out and all of that that is a form of being an employee so that's basically what that lawsuit was about dang and i know we can't get more no we it, can't so. we can't i'm gonna have to pay them folks <laughs> now being an exotic dancer you know we see the flashy lifestyle we see the money but we don't see the behind the scenes as a dancer. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that doesn't get talked about enough when it comes to that lifestyle? Um, what does not get talked about enough is that we do not get paid no uh, check at the end of the night. Like a lot of guys come in there and they come in there with the mentality that we're trying to trick them out of some money like oh now nah, I ain't gonna let these hoes get me. And I'm like on the door, it says strip club. When you go to a strip club, you have to come in there with the mentality of, I'm going in here to spend money. That's a job. We don't get a check. We don't get a nine to five. We don't get paid hourly. We, we get paid off of what you give. So at the end of the day, I just feel like just showing love to every woman in there is just cool. Like, even if she not cute, if she don't look like how you want, just throw some money. Every time I used to go to Cheetah, I, the girls, everybody get a $5 on the stage. Like, and I used to work there too. That was one of the first um, gigs that I started working at when I moved to Atlanta. So I just feel like sh support, support these girls because they're in there working and it don't matter what you want through at home. Like your lights can be about to be turned off, your kid, your baby daddy, everything. And you still gotta go and entertain somebody else. So it's hard. As I know with being a dancer, like you guys have to have super tough ass skin. So Facts. how were you really able to hold your own as a dancer? I'm not even gonna lie, it, it, was, it was hard, it was hard. Like, I feel like, I'm not gonna lie, some guys, I feel like they go in there because they don't get no girls on the outside, so it's their chance to kind of get back. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like one of those girls that like, look at me, like I look good, so guys will be like, Oh, you look too expensive for me. I can't, I can't. And I don't like being told no. You tell me no, I'm like, nigga, I wouldn't even talk to you outside of here, so uh-uh. So it was kind of hard for me to hear no. I'm spoiled. Like, t no means <laughs> you think I'm ugly. I'm not, uh-uh, I don't like that. So it was hard at first getting denied and turned down, and then guys will come in there and, or they want extra shit for nothing. And it's just like, no, I'm not doing, I'm at work, man. I'm here to work. I'm here to make money, and that's it. I want to go home. And um, most of my dance career, I had a girlfriend, so I was ready to get back home. I was in there looking at the girls like, go ahead, friend, dance. <laughs> <laughs> and what made you reach your breaking point with that? Um, it was never really, it was always a breaking point. I never really even wanted to do it. My home girl um, talked me into it. I was working at a retail store um, and she needed a job and she was like, girl, go try out with me. And then we ended up trying out together. We both got the job. And I really wasn't even, I was not gonna stay. The first week was free for me. 
I cried that whole first week because I was not used to guys touching me, feeling on me, nothing. I felt disgusted. I was just like, I can't do this. And she was like, girl, after the first week, you can leave. I'll be cool with you just staying for a week. After that first week, I was making like $1,000 a day. <laughs> and like, I'm like crying. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be back, y'all. I'll see y'all tomorrow. And then it just became one of those things where over the years, I was just seeing a lot more. Like, it was a lot of drugs. It was a lot of girls snorting coke. It was a lot of um, just a lot of pressure about like having sex in the club and stuff like that. And I really wasn't trying to get into that. I was trying to get my money and go. So every night, I would just kind of pray like, please get me out of here because a relationship was something, I worked better in a relationship. And I felt like um, guys didn't take me serious because they saw me in the strip club and they don't know that strippers can be totally different outside of work. It's not like, I, I didn't take my work home with me. So I wanted a relationship, so I had to make sacrifices and I felt like stepping away would give me the relationship that I wanted. Did you ever want to go back once you took that leap and just went away from it? Yeah, of course I did. I've all like my my I, I just like maybe four or five years ago I stopped dancing and it was the hardest thing. And every relationship that I had been in, I was telling dudes like I'm not quitting. Like, can you make up for this money? Cause I'm not quitting. And then my grandmother told me she was like, you are so hard. You need to let somebody in because you're gonna find yourself lonely and you know, it's, it's good to have a relationship and be loved and to love on somebody. So I took a leap of faith and I trusted a guy and then it was like, I shouldn't have did that. But it was like, I put myself in a position now where I can't go back. I'm not gonna go back for them to be like, we told you we was gonna be back. So we all know that you were in a relationship that was heavily in the public eye. Yes. What would you say were some things that you learned about yourself after that was over with? Uh, I learned that I'm a people pleaser. Well, I was a people pleaser. Um, I did a lot of stuff to make people like me, make people really care. And um, I didn't stand up for myself. And when I did start standing up for myself, it really caused a problem. Um, so I felt like then I was still young and that was my first real relationship and a real public relationship. So it was just, it was me struggling to find myself because somebody who's already established as a person, people think that you're just there for like the monetary, financial stability type of thing. And I was there for love, but you know, of course what it looks like on the outside. And um, I just felt like I had, to, I had to learn myself all over again. I'm still learning myself to this day, but I learned how to love and I learned what I want out of a relationship. And you, everybody just has to go through that one where it just shakes right. your whole world right. up. And then afterwards, you're like, I am never letting this right. shit happen to me ever again. And I'm the strong friend, so I can't even, I, when I look back on stuff like that, I can't even believe that I put myself in a situation yeah. because my friends all called me and I'm like, leave him. He ain't shit. Let's go to the club, bitch. And I got some ballers on call right now. Where we going? And I was that person, like, not believing the, my own signs. Like, I had red flags. I had everything there. And I did not listen. I made excuses. And I'm like, nah, it's the, he didn't answer the phone because, you know, he didn't answer the door because, you know, I, I just, I wanted to be number one. And so I wanted, I wanted to have someone, so I made him work. Bro, it is so crazy that like how you said you guys being a strong person, you get in the in a relationship and like that shit just goes out right. the window. Right, people people think it's so easy. Um, I I I was online and you know you see comments and I think a lot of people ask questions like, well, why did you go back or why did you stay? And that's the hard thing that people don't know about relationships and love. Love is like a real drug and it gives you the same emotions or same feeling as a drug. So you can become addicted to that feeling and that's the feeling why you keep going back and keep wanting that because you feel something. Um, and, and, and I think that's what it was for me. Like I, I felt loved at first, you know, and I wanted to keep that feeling. And whenever it got bad, I thought of the good moments and I'm like, well, if I could just get him to 
go back to this spot, we'll be good. If I can just, if I can just stop us from arguing, then we can get back right. And when it comes to being in a public eye relationship like that, how did you maintain your sanity with people knowing so much about the relationship? I don't know. I really didn't. I, I guess I was kind of like coached by my ex and their, their um, group and friends. It was kind of like, you know, oh, media only lasts for seven days. You know, everything will go away in seven days. Me, I'm just having fun. And I'm like, hey, I got a, I got a boyfriend. I don't have to put the Y in your nigga no more. I don't have to steal the Y out of your nigga. So um, I think I was just mostly doing what, you know, they said do. And at the end of the day, it was just kind of like, I was, I was upset because every little thing was just judge. Like I would dance on him. Like every girl posts a video dancing on her man and it's like, oh, she's trying too hard. She's doing too much. And I'm just like, I'm having fun. I'm in a relationship. I'm young. We're, we're in love. So, I mean, I learned not to put myself on online in relationship anymore. That's the biggest thing. Like, like <laughs> I mean, now I'm super cautious about being in a relationship. I don't want anything public because I'm like, no. And I feel like it's hard because a lot of females, they would be in my DMs like, hey, girl, let's hang out. But then I'll check my ex phone and I'm like, this bitch in my man DMs, she in his phone. Like, it's, uh, it's janky. Wow. And with all of the drama surrounding the relationship, did you ever question your self-worth through that? Of course. I mean, uh, when you're in a relationship that can be verbal, physical, whatever kind of abuse you're going through, it can be hard and it can make you question your self-worth because if somebody's telling you, you ain't shit, you ain't gonna be nothing, you ain't nothing without them, and it's repetitive, words cast spells. So whether you know it or not, you somewhere down the line start believing some of it. And I had to go through like a whole year of like, where I just, cut shit off, I just escaped, and I just had to rebuild myself. And with rebuilding yourself, like, what did that take for you? Um, I had to do things that I enjoyed, figured out who I was, like, what I wanted out of life, what made me happy again, um, getting, uh, what the saying is, getting under somebody else to get over somebody else. So, I mean, I did that, you know, I, I, I got flued out. I had fun and I just experienced life again because, you know, when you get in a relationship, sometimes you trade the eyes for weeds, whether you want to or not. And getting into your career, what was the start of the Kiyomi brand? Kiyomi has always been Kiyomi. Um, from the time I was a little girl, I've always said like, I want to be rich and famous. I want to be rich and famous. And for a while, I was only famous, like, or a celebrity or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then I, I started telling people like, uh-uh, this ain't working. Like, so many people, you see them and they're not making no money. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to just be famous. I want the money now. Like, so, you know, I started working on the rich part. And so <laughs> now I'm getting money and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Right. Um, um, I created Kiyomi like as my alter ego. Kiyomi Leslie. Leslie is the calm, sweet, loving, the person that, you know, the guys fall in love with. Kiyomi is the bad bitch, the all put together bad bitch, period, all day. That's her. And she's been here for a very long time. And girl, you've been on these shows, so we got to talk about that. Now, yeah. I do know that you were on Wild and Out. Yes. So, what was it like? What was life like as a Wild and Out girl? Um, Wild and Out. It was very fun. I'm not gonna lie. Like, you get to meet a lot of people. You get to um, change clothes all the time. Get done up. It was fun. Uh, the experience was really good. Uh, shout out to Nick Cannon and the whole Wild and Out crew. Um, I'm forever grateful for that experience because that's really where it started at. Like, I didn't know anything about how TV worked until I actually got on there. And I was so nervous, like, to the point where I would be shaking before <laughs> we got on stage. And I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, God. And then I just started realizing, like, this is just repetitive. We do the same thing every day. Why are you so nervous? And it became like, Family, everybody became family. How did that, did they initially reach out to you? 
Yeah, um, my homegirl Lala is a casting um, director and she told me that Wild and Out was having a audition and she was like, you know, I do a lot of videos so come out to the Wild and Out. She think I'll do good. And so I came and I tried out and uh, we had to walk. At first we had to like do this little model walk and I did my model walk. I almost tripped. I was like, I'm <laughs> losing right now. What the fuck? But um, after I tripped, I kept it going. Everybody was like, yeah. So I was like, okay. And they gave me my little Wildin' Out um, bag and I was a Wildin' Out girl. And then I got called back for the show. And right around that time, um, I started dating my ex. So it was just one thing after another. And it was a, it was a great experience. Like, I'm not even gonna lie, Wildin' Out is, I feel like every girl who wants to be in the social media, whatever type of lifestyle, that's a great job to start at. And I also know that you were on Growing Up Hip Hop. Mm -hmm. So with that show, what were some crazy things you went through that we didn't get to see? Um, it was a whole bunch of crazy things. I feel like that show kind of like crippled me from being me. It was me being someone's girlfriend and not me being a person myself. Like, um, I had a miscarriage. We were supposed to film that. We did not film it. Um, I had a, I feel like my wilding out scene got cut into my ex's wilding out scene. It was supposed to be, you know, me showing my job, me showing my lifestyle, um, me really showing my music and what I was really doing. Um, me and uh, Shy really interacting and really becoming cool, like really having the relationship that we really have, which is loving and friendly. Um, it was a lot of stuff. I just feel like, you know, there was a time and a place for everything and I feel like whatever's meant to be is gonna be and I feel like it turned out for the best because I've moved on bigger and better. And when you left, I'm sure it was like a, woo, I can finally just be myself. For sure, like for sure. I always wanted to, I always wanted to do um, reality, but I wanted to actually be myself. Right. And it's, and it's hard because when you're being someone other, or when they're compressing who you are, it's kind of hard and it, it makes you feel like, well, dang, I wish people could really get to see me instead of me being portrayed as this jealous, gold digging girlfriend and that's not who I am. Now, you know we gotta talk about love and hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> so how exactly did that opportunity come for you? Um, damn, I can't even really remember. Um, I feel like, Somebody that I knew hit me up with the opportunity. They were like, hey, we got this job opportunity. And I'm like, what is it? And they're like, love and hip hop. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what's up. Like, you know, so I went and spoke to who I needed to speak to. And they ended up loving me and saying, we want you to be on. And we did a lot of talking, a lot of talking. <laughs> and, and then everything panned out. And when you first got on the show, what were like your initial thoughts and feelings? Um, my initial thoughts and feelings is these bitches is definitely gonna wanna fight me, period. Cause look at me, honey, these bitches really got something. These bitches is old, crusty and dusty and I'm about to give a bitch a run for her money, period. <laughs> Now young, with, young cootie cat in the building, what's good? <laughs> now with all the drama that goes on in the show, would you say that it could take a toll on you on the outside world of it? Do I think that the show can take a toll on my real life? The drama in the, the show can take a um, toll on your real of life. Of course, like I definitely think that it, it can take a toll on your real life because I feel like for the people who've been on there the longest, I feel like they get really wrapped into this, like this shit is really their life. And then for me just getting into it, like it was people trying to create drama with me that I don't even know. And I'm like, I never met you in my life. Like, why do you have so much animosity to me? Like, I mean, I know why it's clear, but I'm just like, for me, I was having fun and, and I, I really don't, I was trying to make friends and live my best life, but they was just taking that shit too serious. And I'm just like, okay, I get it, this is your <laughs> life, but it's not mine. And then people, offline or whatever who watch the show, they really feel like they know us because they seen a clip not knowing that this is edited and cut down to what makes sense or looks right at the end of the day. We probably shoot hours worth of film and then they cram it into 30, 45 minutes. 
So you got to know that it's, everything is not always how it looks. And I've always wondered that, I don't even know if you could answer this question, but you know, with the drama, is mm -hmm. it like scripted drama or this is like real life shit? Um, <laughs> can you answer that? No, I can answer it. It's, okay. it's real life, it's real life shit. Like, <clears throat> but what I, uh, what people don't understand is that sometimes even real life is set up. Like you set shit up, it's never, nothing is scripted. Like they don't tell you what to say. But I mean, if I know you don't like somebody and I invite that person to the party, then we'll just see what happens. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's messy. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the craziest thing that you've experienced with being on that show? Um, it's a couple things. Okay, I, I experienced a fight. And I'm like, you know, I ain't never seen a fight that close. Like, other people fighting. Like, when I'm in the club, I'm like up here and the people fighting are down here. So I was just like, damn, they fighting real. Like, a drink got thrown on me. I got, <laughs> got on my little cute outfit. I'm like, hold on. And then the girl came up to me talking about something. You want to fight? I'm like, hold on. I'm here for you. Like, what are you doing? Uh, we can fight. Let me take off my <laughs> wig real quick. Nah, but, um... And then um, I was doing a cooking scene and they freaking, I guess they made it look like I was putting ketchup only in the spaghetti. And I was not, I was, I had my prego and I put ketchup in it to make it a little bit sweeter, ketchup and sugar. And I was just like, what? People think I can't cook. I'm from, I'm from North Carolina, we can cook. You know what? I think I remember that. Yes. I definitely remember It was that. like, oh, she can't cook. I don't want to eat her spaghetti, Lord. I'm like, oh, my God. But, you know, Shooter ate that. He ate the whole plate and went back for some more. Period. Period. <laughs> now, what are the pressures that come with being on reality TV, and how do you protect yourself and your brands from the outside critics? Um, you have to know what you want. Like, when going in, you got to know who you are and don't let nobody else tell you who you're gonna be. Um, that was something that I was just, I was just, if I didn't wanna do something, I said I didn't wanna do it and I'm not gonna do it no matter what. And I'm not gonna sacrifice who I am. If it means I'm not gonna work next season, I'm not gonna work next season because I'm not, I'm not gonna do something that I don't feel comfortable with and a lot of people will. And you have, I mean, everybody got morals and I feel like with morals, you, you know what your morals are. My morals are not your morals. So, I mean, we all do what we wanna do. Um, I separated it from my real life and at the end of the day, um, as long as my family know who I am and what, I, what, I, what I'm about, then I'm cool with that. And what would you say is a big misconception about you that you're tired of hearing? Girl, it's so freaking many. Gosh, first of all, I'm tired of people saying that I beat this man up because for one, <laughs> I did not beat nobody up. Like, I used to have really long nails, <laughs> so it's easy to get scratched. For two, I'm really tired of people saying because I look good and all this and I'm well put together that I'm a gold digger. Um, I'm well kept and I think that every woman should have requirements of being um, well off. And I think that anybody who makes you feel like you shouldn't be taken care of is broke and you need to stay far away from them. Um, but yeah, gold digging, I feel like that's a broke man's excuse for why he can't have a bad bitch. And um, I wanna be taken care of, period. And I'm not gonna feel any way about it, so yeah. Now, Kiomi, we have to talk about you being an artist and pursuing your music career. I am super excited for what you have for us. So, yes. how has the transition been from reality TV star to now becoming a full-time artist? Um, it's been really hard, but I feel like at the end of the day, it's been... I, I, I did everything when I said I was going to do it, and I feel like the timeline for everything is working the way it should be because I, I had to leave a lot of music on the table and the reason why is because I did a lot of music but I didn't handle the business aspect of it and I and it's because I didn't know and um now that I do know how the music business works you know and I'm still learning because it's a lot to the music but 
I feel like now that I know a little bit of it, I'm able to do my work and not have to leave a lot of music on the table because I didn't do split sheets, because I didn't do um, little, little stuff like that. And it comes to janky business. And then people are mad because you didn't do split sheets, you didn't, or you had somebody in the studio saying, yeah. put that in the background. And now they want parts. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I don't even want to do the song no more. <laughs> so now it's just like, I'm back, I'm better than ever. And I feel like it was just me perfecting my craft with all the music that I did have to leave on the table. Now, what exactly motivated you to take it serious and go with it full time? Um, when I realized that people were trying to keep me from accomplishing this dream, like when people were like, oh, you're not going to do it. You can't do it without me. Like, I really realized, like, it's something in me that you see that I can't see. Because at first I was scared. Like, when you're an artist, you're, you're, you're scared about other people criticizing you. And that's, that was my biggest thing. Like, I'm a perfectionist to the max. So I was just like, I got to make sure everything's right. And when I felt like people were, sometimes when you have haters, it makes you, for me anyway, it makes me work harder. Because I'm like, damn, they see something in me that I don't see in myself. It's something about me. I have a light. And they see me going far. So I need to keep doing whatever they say don't do because it's something to it. And now I'm just like, you know, when I hear my music, I'm like, damn, I'm really good. And I, and I look at other people and I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't even know why I'm playing with myself because this shit's trash. Now, why? Well, I've often seen that when people do step into uh, their music career from reality TV stars, they get overlooked. Mm -hmm. Have you had to experience that? Um, nah, like I hear a lot of people talk about that. I hear a lot of people saying like, being a sexy girl is hard and people not taking you serious. I mean, how they feel about me is not my problem. I mean, I'm going to continue to be who I am. And I feel like at the end of the day, I'm not going to tone down sexy because it intimidates you. Right. If anything, I'm going to turn it up. And the people that's intimidated is going to step to the side. And the people that love it is going to love it, period. And what sacrifices, well, what are some big sacrifices that you've had to make when it comes to you as an artist? Um, big sacrifices. I don't really, not, I haven't had to experience any sacrifices. I mean, long nights in the studio to sleep, because now I have a child, so yeah. I mean, I, I stay in the studio late at night because he's sleeping at night, so it's easier for me to get out. Um, sleep, so then when I get home in the morning, I'm tired. That's about the only thing that I've had to sacrifice so far, sleep. And what would you say brings out the best in you musically? A vibe, um, my hookah. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't smoke. Um, I, I drink a little bit. So having a good hookah, good energy around me. Um, and I'm not one of those people that like a lot of people in the studio. I like a small crew, like people that I really enjoy their energy, creative energy. Um, that's me. And who are some musical influences for you? It's so many, it's so many, it's so many, it's so many. Um, I always, uh, I've always um, loved Lil' Kim, and I love Lil' Kim because she's nasty. And like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, talk that, talk that. I you don't give me that, you tonight. give me that Lil' Kim. Right, I love Lil' Kim. Um, and I also love um, Trina because she was nasty, but she was like real, real pretty and to Diddy, but she talk her shit like, yeah, I'm a nasty bitch and I'm cute and I'm gonna get these niggas for their money, period. And I love um, Nikki because she was all of it mixed in one. She was a nasty, cute, to Diddy, uh, top dollar, all that shit. Um, I love Foxy because of how her flow was. Um, real, real sexy, real hard, real New Yorkish. Um, yeah, those are, those are my top girls so far. And how would you describe your sound? Um, I feel like my sound is a little, is a little hard. It's still sexy, um, southern, but I feel like if you, if you, I can sound like I'm from up north, and I don't know why that is, <laughs> but I feel like I'm all of those girls mixed in one. Um, I like to sound sexy. I like to sound. I like to pronounce my words sometimes I'm like too proper and I'm like I don't like how I sound like that but um yeah and you finna drop a project yes so you got to tell us all about that 
Um, my project is coming soon. I have not put an official date on it because, like I said, I'm a perfectionist. Um, if it was up to my team, we'd be dropping right now. Um, so I know we are trying to drop before fourth quarter. Um, it's gonna be basically me. And I think I'm sexy, cool, fly. So my music is gonna, gonna um, speak to that. Like, you know, um, we all talking about pussy money hoes, all that shit. So at the end of the day, it's gonna have some of that in there. But at the same time, I won't be talking about something else too. And what other upcoming projects do you have in the works? Um, right now I'm working on my YouTube, Kiyomi Leslie. Um, just telling people how it is to be a mom. Um, I have a book on the way and that's really it. I'm really dedicated. I've been, I've, I've taken some time off to, you know, do the mom thing and, you know, give my child the best that I can. I haven't really shown him a lot because I didn't want him to get dragged into my lifestyle. Cause you know, kids don't choose. They just are here and whatever we give them is what they acquire. So um, I just started saying that I wanted to focus on giving him the best because I know my childhood for me, I grew up without a father and that was really hard um, for me. So I said, I wanted something different. Um, I want to give him a lifestyle that has me being there. And so he can remember that, you know, mommy loved me. And I'm trying to raise a son that these girls don't have to be afraid of, a gentleman. I love that. You're doing an amazing job. Thank like you. It is really hard having a kid and balancing everything that it's you're very doing. Hard. So I give you all the flowers, girl. I feel, all like, of them. I feel like these fellas need to give women all the flowers as well because they don't really understand what women sacrifice on a day-to-day -day basis with being a mom and being, in, being a work figure too. Because, I mean, I stepped away and I'm like, I'm going to do the full-time house mom thing. Like, I'm, I'm going to be a housewife. And then I'm like, damn, this is a job. It's a real job. And then you have to get up and do a job. That's like a lot. A lot. On top of your emotional state and everything else. So that's cool. But, girl, you here looking bomb, doing an amazing job. You know, seven months. And we oh, love where? to see it. But Period. before we wrap up, do you have any advice for any young girls who are struggling with their identity? Um, all that I can say is that sometimes when you are struggling with an identity crisis or when you don't know who you are, um, it's better to just be yourself, like live in who you are right now at the moment because we change. And a lot of people think change is a bad thing, but change is really not a bad thing. Like when I look back at pictures of who I was, I'm like, sometimes I'm embarrassed. I'm like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I wore that. But um, we change and we evolve. And part of evolving is going through trial and error. And if you don't have any failures, then you know, you're not really living right because you have to fail in order to know how to do something. Like you have to start it. Um, and I feel like, you know, looking on Instagram is not going to give you an identity. A lot of girls look at Instagram and they think that this is I've been around a lot of industry people, and what I've realized is that people are not really living how they say they are. Like, it's a lot of stuff that you see, and you're like, damn, these little girls are dying to look like this. And, you know, girls are editing their pictures. They don't even look like that. So, you know, you just gotta be yourself and live in the moment. I, I see now, like, if you think about it, look at, look at all those celebrities. Some of them used to be the quiet introverts, the people that were considered weird or nerds. So it's okay to be different. When you're different, you stand out. Oh, I love that. And any last words or shout outs before we wrap up? Um, shout out to my sister, Brittany Blanco and Key Sweets. Um, shout out to my baby, Baby K. Um, shout out to my baby daddy. Um, that's it really. Shout out to the team, BMG. Period. Work it, yeah, work it, yeah, work it, and work it good. Work it.